This video is about the diversions that have been put in place for the Roselle West Connex interchange. And by diversions, I mean the diversions that have been put in place for cyclists. These were put in a bit over a week and a half ago. And if you ask me, the planning for them and the implementation has been pretty substandard. And I'm not having a go at the fact uh, uh, there's a diversion there. I'm not complaining about the, the fact we're building a, uh, the West Connex tunnel. Um, I think the tunnel's a good idea. And a diversion is not a problem for me. Uh, my ride to work is, you know, the closest, shortest route is 12 kilometres. And for the last 10 years, I've actually been taking two diversions every day, which make it closer to 18 kilometres. Because I need the exercise, I like getting out in the open air in the morning, it gets me in the right headspace. And if it's a really nice day in summer and I've got time before my meetings, I'll actually go right through the city to the domain and go and look at the opera house from the other side at Mrs. Macquarie's chair which will make it a 23 kilometre um, ride into work rather than 12. So this is not a complaint about a diversion which makes you ride a little bit further. What it is, it's a complaint about the, the poor quality of the planning that's gone into creating these diversions and the implementation of them, particularly the wayfinding signage and the, uh, well, the elimination of hazards along the way and cycling specific hazards. So the planning for this um, all comes from this thing called the TTAMP, Transport, Traffic and Transport and Access Management Subplan, put together by John Holland and presumably presented to Transport for New South Wales or, or whoever it is that's the governing body for this project, uh, probably with some other documentation as well. And, and it's actually uh, covered in here as being one of the requirements for um, ministerial approval to go ahead. So it's, it's a legal or contractual document that's required and, and it's 117 pages long. And um, look, this, this is not a trivial rant that I'm gonna go on. This is not some off the cuff rant I'm gonna do because I've just gone out to try and buy a webcam to do better quality uh, video and they're all sold out thanks to everyone needing to work from home at the moment. And I've spent a rainy weekend reading lots of documentation. I've gone and ridden the route I've videoed it, I've come back and analysed the video. So I've, to produce this video, I've probably put 20 hours of, uh, of research and reading into it. So it's, it's not just, yeah, like I said, an off the cuff rant about the, you know, how bad it is. There's actually some, some background to this, so I, I hope you'll stick with me. Right, um, if we have a look at the document, it's um, the, the, the one I've got hold of, which was made public, uh, it's dated the 30th of January 2020. That's now six weeks ago. And um, I can, you can see that it's been through 16 versions or revisions. Uh, lots of people have reviewed it and approved it. Uh, who knows who they are, but uh, they're all redacted out. So, you know, if, uh, you'd think a reasonable amount of thought and effort's gone into preparing this plan. And, and obviously you'd have to because it covers a lot of truck movements through a lot of suburbs. Um, changes to streets and all sorts of things that are not related to cycling. So you'd expect it to be, you know, a detailed piece of work. And 117 pages might sound like a lot to some people, but projects I've worked on, um, typically a, a design or an as-built document would be uh, up to 250 pages long, and a uh, user guide to go with that could be 300 pages plus. So I don't see this as being a uh, you know, War and Peace or, or the Lord of the Rings or something like that in ter terms of documentation that's, you know, adequate, maybe thin. Now, uh, what's the context of this? Well, as I said, uh, this has been prepared to address the requirements of the Minister's condition of approval. I don't know if that's the Road Minister, the Environment Minister, the Planning Minister, who knows, but it's, it's clearly, it's a condition. They had to hand this thing over, presumably, and have it approved before they could start work. Who they handed it to, who read it, who approved it, no idea. Uh, okay, we we'll look at the objectives of this. Um, so a key objective is to ensure that traffic and pedestrian impacts during construction are minimized and within the scope of the planning approval. This includes minimizing delays and ensuring consideration is given to the needs of all road users and maintaining safety for both workers and the general public. Okay, that's, that's all nice. Now, we then go into the specific performance outcomes to deliver that objective. And, and number one, interestingly enough, is minimize traffic impacts. There's five objectives, I've only shown four here. Number four, maintain pedestrian and cyclist safety. So looking at the order of that, which one's number one and which one's number four, which one do you think is the most important in the minds of the people that wrote this document and who are implementing this plan? I'd say number one. Now, 
Um, the problem with that is if you look at all the Austroads documentation that's been put out in the last couple of years, the most recent revisions, and, um, and interestingly, the, the way I got onto this is it was discovered that um, three of the Austroid documents that are referenced in this plan were a decade out of date or so. They're all from 2009. And all the documentation I, I read from 2013 onwards, all the later revisions that uh, superseded this stuff, all talk about the safe systems approach or the safe systems principles. And under the safe systems approach, safety is number one and mobility is the second consideration. So I would have thought if they were using the most recent versions of any Austroads guide, they would have put safety as the first priority there or the first objective and mobility as second, third, fourth order objective. So what is a safe systems approach? Um, well, it, it can involve reducing road capacity, removing on-street parking, that's important for Gordon Street, um, reducing speeds or restricting uh, access to side roads and private properties. That seems to not factor into this plan. Um, safe, uh, safe operation should be established as the first priority and then mobility can be maximised within those boundaries as long as it does not compromise safe operation. This is, in effect, the reverse of traditional practice. So what I showed you before would probably be traditional practice. Mobility or speed is the first priority. Safety comes in at number four. This is, uh, you provide a level of safety. Uh, you provide a level of safety once all mobility objectives have been met. That's the old way of doing things. New one is you make it safe and then you see what you can push through it. Now, if I'd been writing the, this, uh, this plan, I would have cut and pasted these paragraphs out of all these guides that they're referencing, the guide to traffic management, the guide to traffic safety, all those things, and stuck them in right at the front of the, uh, of the transport plan to say, um, you know, these are, these are the principles by which we're abiding. These are from the Austroads, uh, you know, core documents with, and Austroads is made up of all the um, roads ministries or departments or whatever around Australia, including, you know, the New South Wales RMS. So it's not like um, by doing that, you're going against any principles um, that have been adopted anywhere in Australia or New Zealand for that matter. Now, if you look at the desired performance outcomes in the plan, it lists all sorts of things about connectivity and reducing travel times and stuff. Not a word about safety, <laughs> not a thing. So again, it comes back to, did they bother using the more recent versions of the documentation which talk about the safe systems approach because if they had wouldn't they have said something about safety there now this is where we get into the the guidelines that have been referenced and if you ask me this is a pretty poor way of uh, referencing anything but they've referenced the Austroads Guides to Traffic Manage Management 2009 the Guide to Road Design 2009 and the Guide to Road Safety 2009 which have all been superseded and they all mentioned the safe systems approach and they all mention when you look through the, um, or at least some of them mention when you look through the version control section, that in later versions, they adopted the safe systems approach. So this, this is just an example of what I'm used to doing as far as a, a, a references table would, would look like, where I've actually cut and pasted the, um, the title of the document from the document, as well as the reference number, like AGTM01-19, because you can go and search on that on the Austroad site. You can search on Google and it will come up and you can find it. There's no, uh, what is it? You, you know exactly what you're looking for. There's no confusion about is it this document or that document because when we get in, you're gonna see that there's a plethora of documents kind of with the similar titles. And it's like, well, which one are we looking at here? Uh, version, which of course is important because a lot of these documents actually come in lots of parts. Uh, you can see the guide to road safety, for instance, comes in 13 parts, and those parts can be different versions. They're not all version 3.1, might, might be 1.1, might, one might be 6.2. Same goes with release dates. The release date of the set for the guide to road safety is the 22nd of February 2013. But individual documents within that set have got dates all over the place, including, you know, as of, you know, three or four months ago. And then of course you put in the URL, so you wanna make sure that someone can actually find the document you're referencing, they can just click on that and off they go. Right, more in a minute. Um, now, just I'm just going through the document in chronological order. 
Now on page 20, uh, there was this part about setting up a, a temporary traffic control room for the project, which will utilize CCTV, which is, which is good. There's obviously lots of truck and traffic movements going around the place. Um, and if this has been set up, then can it be leveraged to put some cameras in places where cyclist safety is at risk? Now, I hope so. Maybe we'll see something come of that later on, but who knows. Right, impact on pedestrian and cyclist connectivity. So, um, I'm gonna, what I'm gonna say here, I'm probably gonna repeat 10 times before this is over. Uh, Short-term closures or diversions will be introduced throughout the construction phase. I'm not gonna repeat that. Appropriate notifications and signage will be implemented prior to change conditions. I'll repeat that a lot because that kind of wording comes up a lot in this document. And that is the signage will be implemented prior to change conditions. Now, what, is, what does that mean to you or me? Well, I've been driving for, I've had, I've had a license for 35 years and I've driven through hundreds and hundreds of roadworks and diversions and stuff in that time in the country, in the city, uh, you know, I went through three bits of roadworks just on a ride on Tuesday. You know, they were, we had some council workers fixing a 50 metre section of concrete path and they had signage up and they had cones and they had bits taped off and, um, and, and I had to go around a blind right hand bend to go into this work site. And so coming into the bend, there was signage saying warning, you know, workers around the bend. They weren't even on the road. There was a pile of parked cars between the road and where they were working, but they still put out this really extensive signage looking from both directions and cones and tape and all sorts of stuff to make sure they had a safe environment and you could see that there was works going on. And uh, you know, we used to go to an abatements bay a lot and a uh, state government built a big diversion around Berry, the township of Berry, and it was like a 200 and something million dollar project went on for years. And whilst that work was going on, while they were building flyovers and new bridges and double lanes and all this kind of stuff, they, they put a diversion in for the, you know, so you could still drive through it. And this diversion was a couple of kilometres long and it was a whole new road as far as I could see that they just carved out of the countryside to have this road you could drive on for like two years or whatever, how long the project went for, over, I don't know, temporary bridges and through cuttings and all sorts of stuff. Sure, the speed was reduced, but you know, they probably spent a good chunk of the budget just building the diversion. So as drivers, we're used to it kind of being laid on thick, that you'll, you'll have concrete barriers and you'll have, you know, good lighting and you'll have a good road surface and, um, you know, it'll, it'll be a, a good fit for purpose piece of road for you to drive on through the diversion. That's not been put in place for the cyclist diversion at all. And the signage, <laughs> and the signage is, it's not non-existent. There are some signs there. <laughs> but, you know, what I was talking about, that 50 metre little bit of concrete laying for, um, uh, for a bit of footpath upgrading, there was more signage in that little 50 metre section than I think there is in this entire diversion. Now, uh, to back that up, I'll probably have to go out there and actually count and photograph every single sign to back that statement up. But I'm probably right because it's just, and I got lost because the signage is so bad, the wayfinding is so bad. And, and so that's why I'm here. I'm not here because I've read some Facebook posts and oh, you know, they've done a terrible job. And I've actually gone out and had a look and, and I can tell you, it's, it's not real flash. Alrighty, um, so moving right along. Uh, so there's more stuff in here about like, for instance, Heavy vehicles will be subject to the existing speed limits and road rules. And, and look, I think a lot of these statements in here are quite interesting because there, there's just this little line, right? Oh, how, are we, how are we going to not compromise the safety of the public? Oh, truck drivers will be subject to the existing speed limits and road rules. Where's the rest of it? How do you actually enforce that? You know, what are you going to do? Are you going to put in speed cameras? Are you going to put GPS units on all the trucks so that uh, all the subcontractors who want to come in with a truck or any sort of vehicle, ute, van, whatever, must have a, a, a GPS fitted, which can be monitored back in a control room. Uh, they must have a dash cam pointing out. They must have a dash cam pointing at the driver to monitor driver behaviour. You know, these are all the sorts of things you could put in there. 
uh, things like, oh yeah, we'll, we'll have a full-time safety officer or, or safety office because we've got so many vehicles moving around and they're on the public roads so much. And they will have a full-time job of auditing that GPS data and the dash cam data to look for dangerous drivers, to look, to look for people in particular who are not driving to the conditions. Because speeding is not necessarily an issue, it's driving to the conditions that's the issue. You know, driving at 40 k's in a 50 k zone sometimes can be hideously dangerous depending on the conditions. So is there anything like that that's been put in? Maybe there's a subsidiary, you know, road safety plan that we don't know about. It's certainly not referenced here. But that, that's the kind of thing I'd be putting in there to say, this is how we're going to make sure a truck does not hit anyone or anything during the life of this project. It's just not there. Okay. And then we get into, again, this area, this section references this Australian standard, 1742.3-2009, 2009 being, uh, I think, the year of issue, traffic control devices for work on roads. Okay, really good. And you can see there's some other things there, but I'm not going to bother about them because, just as an example, I thought I'm going to have a look at this. Go to the Australian uh, Standards website and far out, 300 bucks for a document. You know, someone's doing well for themselves. But... There's a section down the bottom that says superseded, and I opened it up and it says superseded by the same number, dash 2019. So the, um, the updated document was published over, um, does it say when? I don't know, it probably says it somewhere. But um, yeah, that's another one that's uh, it's been superseded. Um, if we have a look at something like they've said, oh, the Roads and Maritime Delineation Manual, March 2008. So I went and had a look at the delineation manual. I had no idea what delineation meant when I started with this. Now I know it means cat's eyes and lines painted on the road and all that kind of thing. Learn something new every day. Uh, so, um, what, what did it say? It came out in March 2008. Uh, well, actually the version documentation says April 2008. But again, we go into this and, it, and the delineation manual is actually a set of documents. And uh, yeah, there is, there is one that actually did come out in um, uh, March 2008. Sorry, what I was talking about, Where, whenever it was. But um, that is possibly not the document I think they'd be using here because I, I would have thought the one they'd be wanting to use here is, is pavement markings or longitudinal markings. But anyway, you, you see what I'm getting at is um, there's no clarity around what documents actually been used and, and more importantly what section out of these documents because some of these documents aren't very long and all they might be using you know when they say oh yes we're referencing this guide well that just might be you know there's a page of stencils of various road markings and they just circle them and say yeah out of these 20 road markings we're going to use these three and that's it you know why not just cut and paste that into the document and say as per the standards, these are the line markings we propose to use, rather than, you know, point you off at a, you know, makes no sense to me. Okay, then we get into the dilapidation report. Um, this really doesn't impact on cycling very much, but the bit that was interesting is that they have to do precondition reports on the roads, because obviously lots of truck movements are going to tear the roads up. And... So the, the precondition reports, it's got to be a written survey, photos, and or video of each road. So I just found it interesting that they're, they're doing that for the roads and um, was video taken of the diversion that's been put in place for cyclists. Uh, and, and if so, you know, was that used by the safety auditor or the planners or anyone like that to identify all the hazards and then to come up with a list of items that needed remediation uh, potholes, cracks in the road, um, symbology which is faded, missing signage, uh, overhanging trees, um, poor uh, curb ramps, um, narrow islands, uh, poles in the in the road. You know, there's a million things you could probably think. Okay, not a million. It's probably 127 things you could think of. But was video used because it had to be used for the the precondition reports for the roads. So there's a, a precedent set there for doing this kind of thing for the cycling facilities. Right, next part, speed management. Um, so the contractor is conscious of the potential for speed reductions over long distances to have negative impacts on road user travel times. Okay, so what do we talk about about 15 minutes ago? The safe systems approach. 
What's the most important thing in the safe systems approach? Safety. What's the second most important thing? Mobility. So why are they concerned about this? The, the speed stuff should all be about creating a safe environment, not caring about, and then the second thing you worry about is how quickly people can transit through that environment, their mobility. So again, I look at this and I think that's, that's just another indicator that they're using old documentation that's been superseded that doesn't include the safe systems approach. Okay, signposting and delineation. And, and this is really important for someone like me who has no map memory. And, and I know this because uh, my, my wife has an unbelievably good map memory. She's on one end of the spectrum and I'm way down the other. And she can just, we're going somewhere, she'll study a map, she'll refuse to use the GPS and she gets us there. Gets infuriated when I use the GPS because it's like, why do you need to use that stupid thing? Well, I do because I have no map memory. So for me, signposting and delineation is, is crucial. And of course, the other thing you've got to think about is people will use these diversions in the dark. And so you need to have sufficient, sufficient signposting, etc., to actually find your way in the dark. Uh, because I know okay, winter is coming, but um, I normally leave for work before 6 a.m. and I'm normally cycling into the office around 7 a.m. In two months time, it's gonna be still, sun's just gonna be coming up at 7 a.m. When I'm going through this diversion, it's gonna be pitch black. So anyone who starts riding or whatever uh, at that time needs to be able to find their way through in the dark. And not only that, the condition of the road and everything needs to be safe enough to use in the dark. Um, you know, you don't want people crashing into bollards or, or potholes or, you know, curbs or something like that because you can't see them in the dark. You know, that's, that's just, that's, you might go, oh yeah, you can see that in the middle of the day. Well, try seeing it at 6am when the, you know, when street lighting is not real flash. Uh, so yeah, as it says in the document, um, you know, signposting, signposting and delineation is an important aspect of road safety, yes, and traffic management, yes. Um, uh, warning signs give advance notice of traffic hazards. Yes, yes they do. Uh, road markings and pavement markers, and, and road markings and pavement markers are, are really important for cyclists because you spend a lot of your time looking at the road because the, uh, if, you know, if you run over something, chances are your wheel's gonna go out from underneath you or whatever, and you're gonna crash. And having crashed multiple times, I can tell you it's a pretty unpleasant experience, and I've lost a fair bit of skin over, over the years. And, and so your focus is, is down there. You're not looking up at poles and stuff for, uh, for signage. And that's why um, uh, road markings and pavement markers, you know, with bike symbols and stuff like that, narrows and turn here and all that kind of thing, are really crucial for cyclists. And, and that is just totally, totally lacking in this diversion. Whoever did it, uh, the planning or the, or the audit, I'm guessing they probably walked through it or they drove through it or both. Uh, I don't think they rode through it or I don't think they got an experienced cyclist to go through it because they would have picked that stuff up in a, in a flash and had it fixed before the diversion opened. And that's, that I think is the crucial thing. They might have a document there with all this stuff listed in it, but why the hell wasn't, you know, how hard is it to get a bloke out with a, a spray gun and some stencils to respray, you know, 50 or 60 um, or 100 line markings on the road? Um, okay, and advice of routes and destinations which assist all drivers to make clear early decisions. And that's really important when you've got a diversion because, it, you know, normally you're going straight through in a diversion, obviously, you know, going around all over the place. And, you know, the thing I really noticed about the diversion is you, you're going along, you come up to an intersection, you go, which way am I going? Um, and, you know, you need to know in advance which way you're going to go. I mean, a good diversion has a sign, you know, if you're turning left up at the next intersection, there'll be a sign there at the intersection saying turn left. But 50 or 100 metres or whatever before that intersection, there'll be warning signs. I mean, we have this, when, you, when you're driving in the country and you're coming up to a, a, some roadworks, they don't, you know, they don't drop you from 100 k's to 40 going into a set of roadworks with no warning, do they? There'll be signs sometimes back kilometres saying roadworks ahead. And then your speed will drop in 20 kilometre hour increments before you get into the 40k zone. You know, that's, this stuff is just it's common sense and it's well known and it's in the guides but none of it's been applied. It's like, why not? Is it because, they, again, they're using out-of-date guides or they don't care? 
the signage has all been stolen, or someone's been out there scraping the line markings off the road last weekend. I don't know. Uh, anyway, and the other thing to ensure the appropriate information for road users is, is effectively communicated at all times. I mean, they've written this down and they haven't done it. There is no effective communication. It's rubbish. Might as well be in Russian or something printed in a you know book that's all glued together. Uh, okay, so delineation again, the RMS Guide to Delineation Manual uh, 2014. So that's been referenced and I went into this and it's like, so where's, where is this Delineation Manual 2014? There's various sections of the manual. There's pavement arrows dated from 2014, but I think the bit thereafter was the longitudinal markings because having gone in and looked at that section, that, that makes more sense for cyclists. That's dated December 2010, so... We, do, you, do you guys know, do these guys know what manual they're actually using? Did they, did they open the manual and have a look at it? Or did they look at the latest manual and see what was in there? Okay. Pedestrians and cyclists. Again, here we go. Groundhog Day. An alternate route which, which complies with the relevant standards. Yeah, that's the most up-to-date standards, not the, you know, superseded 2009 standards will be provided, and well, it doesn't say that here, of course, you know, what are the relevant standards, whatever you choose to use, uh, will be provided and signposted prior, prior, what does prior mean? Before, to the restriction or removal of the relevant pedestrian and cyclist access. So again, you know, it's here again and again and again. <clears throat> this work would be done, before, you know, before the diversion went in. Putting up a couple of blinky signs uh, does not constitute proper signage, sorry. Not, you know, not in anyone's language. Uh, and this next section, which I won't read, I think refers to what's going to happen at the end of the project when they're finished with the rail yards a couple of years down the track. And it's all going to be remediated and grassed and landscaped and it'll probably be like Brangaroo or something, which is lovely these days. And there'll be cycle paths through it and swings and roundabouts and God knows what else. Um, uh, the, the reason I put this in here is they have to write a plan, and if this, and if the state of this plan is any indication, heaven help us in two years' time. <laughs> I don't know what we're going to get. Probably a garbage tip full of broken rubble. Okay, <clears throat> cyclists. So Groundhog Day again. Um, so the contractor would manage cyclist wayfinding via temporary routes. Yes. That comply with the requirements of AS1742 Part 9 Bicycle Facilities, Austroads Guides Traffic Manage Part 10, and blah blah, you know, all this stuff. Where alternate routes are implemented, they will be appropriately signed and marked. How many times do we have to read that and me tell you that hasn't been done? Uh, cyclists on urban well, local roads would typically utilize shoulders or dedicated paths where they exist. Uh, no. Um, for certainly the majority of the, the, the diversion I took that goes along Balmain Road and along the eastern side of the city, West Link, you're not riding on the shoulder or dedicated. Well, the sections which are dedicated, well, actually not dedicated paths, they're shared paths. So that statement's completely wrong or partly wrong. Okay, we go back to the temporary uh, traffic control room and, and the use of CCTV feeds. Um, <clears throat> so Gordon Street... The diversion up there is clearly the most, uh, or one of the most contentious areas because um, it's a fairly steep street. I did ride up it. I was in low gear, standing up. You, you're really grinding up the hill. They haven't removed the car parking on the left-hand side as you're going up the hill, which would make it safe. They've left the parking there. So it's a narrow road. You're grinding up the hill and you've got rat runners coming around the corner at the bottom of the hill and flooring it, coming up the hill. And they have to cross the double white lines to get around you, which, which is legal. That's what they're supposed to do. Um, but I can tell you those, some of those rat runners are really moving. And so the concern is, you know, someone's gonna come around that corner and they're not gonna move over enough and they're gonna, they're gonna hit someone from behind or clip them or whatever. So uh, would it really be that difficult since it's supposed to be CCTV all around the site and it's, it's huge, stick some CCTV in that street and, uh, and monitor the traffic. And now the fun begins with the acronyms, the TTLG. Um, and the TTLG is, well, the Traffic and Transport Liaison Group, is made up of all these, these different groups. And I found it fascinating that the, the taxi council's in there. People still catch taxis, taxis still exist. Why does an Uber get a mention? 
Uh, I, I guess they've just used the same group of people for years, and it's you know they probably just pick this up from another document and cut and paste it in with. I don't know, they really think about it. Um, but interestingly, the, the traffic manager is supposed to provide all sorts of information to the TTLG, which meets at least once a month. And some of that information is on issues related to pedestrians and cyclists. Well, pedestrians and cyclists are not representative here, or represented. It's, it's all drivers or emergency services. Um, wouldn't it make sense to have them, you know, a cyclist group, for instance, um, or uh, what's his name's fax machine, um, you know, on this liaison group as well. Why, why have they been excluded when one of the major impacts is on cyclists? Because, the, the, you know, this is, a ma this is possibly the major cycling route in Sydney, apart from over the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Beats me. Then we get into road safety audits. I'll probably do another entire um, video on road safety audits. But the thing which got me, because I... I had to go and read the road safety audit documentation as well, but the independence of the road safety auditor, um, who appointed the auditor. Now, I've, I've worked with uh, internal audit in several organisations. I've worked with ICAC on two occasions. I've worked with internal affairs um, in a company. Uh, I've worked with the Auditor General and external auditors, and now I'm working with regulators uh, across a number of countries in, in Asia Pacific and Europe and in the US. And independence of these bodies is usually crucial. Well, it is crucial. I mean, any, any kind of governance model you look at, the auditor is independent of management. And reading this stuff, I can't see any evidence in here that the, the auditor is independent of the contractor management. Because even simple things like um, the, uh, the audit reports and recommendations will be made available to the secretary on request. We, you know, that kind of baffles the mind. I would have thought the Secretary or, or Transport for New South Wales or the RMS or whoever it is that's doing the governance of this would be the ones appointing the auditor and getting the reports. Not on request. They, you know, they would actually report to them. They'd be doing an independent report on what the contract is up to. You know, the, the, the conflict, all the stuff about conflict of interest and blah, blah, blah. But So then I went and I thought, okay, well, I, I'll go and have a look at um, this Ostroads Road Safety Audit Guide. No version, no date. And of course, <laughs> there's, there's multiple documents this could be. Implementing road safety audits, managing road safety audits, take your pick. Which document are they using? Which version? Uh, these, these, these guys are actually really good from Ostroads. And they come with templates and forms and all sorts of stuff. Well, at least the new ones do. And, and the new ones actually have lots of good stuff in there about cycling specific hazards and stuff but if they're using an old version it's not there so how could you do a proper audit if you're using old documentation which doesn't include cy cyclist specific stuff that's why i really i'm really interested to see or i don't know if someone can find out or whether they'll be forced to release this stuff so we can see what they've been using so yeah again here we go Audit reports will be made available to the Secretary upon request. Monthly reporting. Um, so, you know, all these issues will be reported up to, you know, the stakeholders, etc. cetera. And, um, and accidents and pedestrian accidents um, will also be reported. Now, I know on day two, a cyclist crashed his bike and ended up with, you know, blood coming out of his leg uh, on the diversion, on a, on a section which actually that day I'd identified as really dodgy and and I didn't ride through it because I thought it was so dodgy and he's crashed there and he's put it up on Facebook in a group I'm in and what I'm wondering is did that incident will that incident make it into the March report where's it been recorded how's it get recorded is anything been done about with that information um oh well, uh, we're getting towards the end here hopefully um, so again, we, we see stuff here like, um, you know, new or modified roads, parking, pedestrian, cycling infra infrastructure must be designed to meet relevant design, engineering, and safety guidelines, including the Ostroads Guide to Traffic Management. Which one? 2009 version, more recent version. Uh, any other documents? Uh, and then we have the, the independent road safety audit. Okay, and it's all sorts of good stuff in there about that, but... 
um, the you know it says the audit findings and recommendations must be actioned prior to construction of the relevant infrastructure. So I would have thought the diversion is construction of relevant infrastructure. So if there were findings from the safety audit and just me riding through there in an hour, I picked up you know quite a few things which needed fixing. Now, either they were picked up in the audit and they were never fixed prior to construction, which means E56, whatever it is, has been breached, or they were not picked up for some reason. <clears throat> I don't know why, but anyway. Um, uh, E57, safe pedestrian and cyclist access must be maintained around the work sites during construction, and where it's restricted or removed, um, an alternative route which complies with the relevant standards must be provided and signposted prior to the restriction or removal, blah, blah, blah. Where have you heard that before? I told you to hear it a few times. Sick of it now? Um, minimize the number of changes to travel paths and where changes are required. Develop and implement an effective uh, community consultation, com community communication strategy, coupled with temporary wayfinding signage to warn, inform, and guide. Well, I think the communication strategy has been done because, you know, I certainly got a lot of information about this email from Bicycle New South Wales and Facebook groups and, you know, people just stopping and ranting about it at red lights and stuff like that. But has temporary wayfinding signage been put into warm and warn and form and guide? No. 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 Not certainly on the day I went through, it was not there. It was supposed to be there prior to it. And the telling thing for me is that people have been employed to stand at several points and point you where to go. Now, you don't need to employ a person to do that. You just need to print a sign up and stick it on a flipping pole. You know, and if you've stuck a sign up on a pole and you still need to employ a person to do it, then you, your, sign's not, your sign is in the wrong place. <clears throat> or you need warning signage before it. You know, it's, it's pretty bloody simple. It really is. Or you need to put pavement markings because like I said before, People are looking down. So, you know, you spray paint something on the on the footpath to say, hey, you're turning right up here or you're about to do a U-turn or warning, you know, you're about to have to climb some stairs or whatever the hell it is. Um, <clears throat> this will aim to minimise confusion, confusion by providing clear and concise traffic management schemes. Well, I can tell you what, I was, I was bloody confused on the first day and I went off into, you know, la-la land. Um... Okie dokie, and, and now we finally find out who the secretary is they've been talking about all through this document. It's the secretary of the New South Wales Department of Planning and Environment, in case you wanted to know. Okay, construction speed zones. So there's all sorts of stuff in here about how to, uh, or may be implemented to enforce speed limits. Not must, be, not must be implemented, not will be implemented, may. Hear the soft language, the lack of commitment. If it says must, you know, we will put in speed cameras. And here's a map of where we're going to put in the speed cameras. You know, because we've found some obvious spots where speeding is an issue. So there'll be permanent speed cameras there catching people. That to me is must or will. May is, oh yeah, we might get around to it. You know, manana, whatever the Mexican term is. <clears throat> Same with use of speed advisory boards, etc. And then comes the bit about getting police enforcement. And I think that's just been cut and pasted from somewhere because... Um, the, the thing about this is, is if you actually go in and read the police advisory or technical document or whatever it is that um, it tells you how to actually get the police out on a site, this is what it tells you. This is what the police want. Evidence of speeding traffic, such as traffic incidents, near misses, end of queue incidents, I guess that's people, I don't know, ramming into someone at the back of a queue, Near misses, um, I don't know what a near miss is, a near miss of a road worker, or a, a cyclist, uh, head on near miss, whatever. <clears throat> and speed data from available technologies. Um, VMS message boards, I don't know how they, they collect speed. Um, <clears throat> tubes classification counters, I think they're the rubber hoses you find on the roads. And the infrared traffic logger, turtle. Well, I don't know if the turtle still exists. I mean, this is a document from 10 years ago or longer um, but I'm sure we've actually got you know more newer technology that's come along <clears throat> that could provide that kind of speed data on request but 
has any of that kind of stuff actually been set up at these sites where speeding would be identified as a hazard. Um, and of course, what it does say is user pays may apply. Okay, well, let's assume that um, John Holland has to pay for the police to turn up, which you know, is fair enough. Um, we don't know what the rate is, but is there actually a budget for this? Because I mean, that's, that's the crucial thing with any project, isn't it? If there's no budget, nothing happens. So this is one of the questions I'll be saying to them. Okay, one, do you have to pay for police presence? Yes. Do you have a budget? No. Well, why is this section even in the document if there's no budget? Um, okay, oh yeah, we've got a budget. Oh, okay, how many hours of police presence will that actually apply or provide given the, uh, the rates the police are charging? Oh, it'll give us six hours of, uh, of coverage. Oh, oh good, oh, six hours a week. Oh no, six hours over two years. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the, this is the, the kind of, it's like peeling the onion, isn't it? You, know, you just got to keep on asking questions to get to the bottom of it to find out, you know, what the truth of it is. So, um, you know, will we ever actually see police enforcement uh, on site? Um, you know, who knows? Now, the, the, uh, the fun part here is the police document from, you know, yonks ago talks about the hierarchy of controls. And uh, I've, I've substituted that for this lovely diagram, which I've dragged off the internet of, of what it is. And, and you can see it goes from the most effective controls to the least effective. And the most effective control for, uh, for this, for anything, is elimination of, of the hazard, physically remove it. You know, I talked earlier about the, um, the diversion around um, Berry that we used to drive through all the time. There were no power poles along the side of the road in the diversion, there were concrete, those were concrete barriers all the way along. There was no way for you to actually run off the road and hit a power pole. That, yeah, everything had been moved out. And, and you see this kind of thing happen in, you know, lots of things. Oh, there's a hazard there, we'll just pick it up and, and shift it. Substitution, uh, replacing the hazard. Um, engineering controls, isolate people from the hazard. I, I think there's probably talks more about machinery, for instance, where you might put a cage around a machine, you might get your arm caught in, for instance. Um, administrative controls change the way people work. Uh, and we're getting into the, the less effective stuff here. And obviously the least effective is putting on a hard hat and orange clothing, um, PPE. And certainly from what I could see going around the diversion, the, the, the elimination, the substitution, engineering controls, administrative controls, etc. None of that was in place. Um, if I'm wrong, people are free to, to point that out and, and come back and say, oh no, you know, at these locations, these are the controls we put in place. So, okay, you know, I'm happy to admit I'm wrong, but I certainly saw quite a few blindingly obvious hazards where absolutely nothing had been done to remediate them. Nothing, just zero. And, uh, you know, I'll put a video up of, of uh, bits of the ride through and just point out some of the hazards and perhaps how they could be remediated. I mean, you know, it's not me for, to tell the contractor how to remediate these things. I've just got some, you know, some ideas that might work uh, from a cyclist perspective. But, uh, you know, it, it's just mind boggling to ride around. And, and this is where a lot of the, the uh, social media chatter, etc., cetera, has, has revolved around is just the, the number of hazards which is still evident, which should have all been removed prior to this diversion being put in place. You know, we've, we've now got an operating light rail going down George Street. And there was lots of testing of, of that done before the thing opened up, obviously to iron the bugs out and all the rest of it, because, you know, I work on George Street and I see this thing going up and down all the time. You know, they, they didn't, on day one uh, of the opening of the light rail, there were no known safety hazards, I'm sure. You know, they, they wouldn't have gone, oh, you know, the, we haven't got the door sensors set up properly. You know, they might trap someone in the doors. You know, you'd fix that before you start, you know, passengers getting on the bloody thing, wouldn't you? Oh, there's a, there's a hazard if you sit in that seat, there's, there's exposed wiring, you might get electrocuted. But, you know, we're just going to put people on board anyway. <laughs> that, that, no one does that kind of thing. But for some reason, are quite happy to open the cycling diversion with all these, you know, hazards like that in place. It's 
quite interesting. Particularly when you go again, I refer back to all the Austro's guides. What's the first thing? Safety. What's the next thing? Mobility. Now, sometimes I look at this document and I think, was was this document just put together so it's good enough to meet some kind of bare bones criteria to provide legal coverage or contractual coverage for the project to proceed? Because obviously, you know, the government and all the departments want to get on with this thing and and start, you know digging holes and laying concrete and all the rest of it. Um, and, and so, you know, the, 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 the bare passable minimum was done, got it over the line, and that's good enough, thank you very much. You know, we passed, we, we're through that toll gate, we can, we can carry on to the next phase of the project. Um, and, you know, those people over there, well, you know, whatever. Uh, but anyhow, so I did an updated uh, um, reference table because you know, I had to put in the, the technical direction for transport, traffic and transport practitioners, police speed enforcement or presence on RTA work sites. And it was uh, put out in August, 2009. There you go. Um, and there's a URL for it if you want to go and find it. So look, I, I think uh, hopefully just having gone through this document, if you've sat through it this long, um, you can see you know, why I think there's problems with the diversion because the, the, the document doesn't address it particularly well. Uh, and especially if it doesn't use the correct guides, it's, it's never going to address it because um, you know, maybe some of the information they're looking for is, is not in the guides, the old versions that I've referenced. The other thing I found out reading through this stuff is there's all these really good new cycling type guides that have been put out by Ostroads for things like cyclist wayfinding and, uh, and signage, etc., which are not referenced at all. So I would have thought if you're putting in a diversion for cyclists, you would go to the Ostroad site and you'd pull down this new document and go, oh, this is great. It's got all this good stuff in here about how to make this a really good, ridgy ditch diversion that, that meets all the latest standards. No, not even mentioned in here at all. Now, of course, all I've covered is the, the stuff that relates to cyclists. And uh, I haven't bothered looking at any of the environmental documents that's supposed to be used or any of the other kind of stuff. I mean, who knows if they're all out of date as well. Uh, you know, for all I know, uh, you know, the way they wrote this document was they went, oh yeah, you know, we've been doing these kind of uh, traffic sub plans for years. Just go and pull the last one off the shelf and, you know, just change the title and the reference number and type some new stuff in. And yeah, just don't worry about the reference table. We've been using that forever. Just leave it there. Of course, it's been there since, I don't know, 2010. They've never bothered updating it or updating the library either. <coughs> uh, how some, someone would have to be able to explain how that's happened because it boggles the mind uh, that you know a, a company that does this stuff for a living could could miss that so badly. Um, anyway, look if there's if there's any kind of governmenty people watching, uh, I, I really hope that that this um, this document, you know what you've seen of it so far, is not indicative of how the rest of the project's been managed. You know, we saw the light rail project blow out, costing heaps more than it was budgeted to, taking a lot longer, and having getting into all sorts of strife along the way. And you know, obviously, some of that was just due to someone doing some really terrible planning. And you know, to me, uh, you know, I've been a, a project manager on and off for quite some time. I look at this and go. <laughs> wouldn't meet the standards in, in most of the companies I've ever worked in at all. Uh, you know, people I've worked for would give you a flea in the ear and throw you out of the office and tell you to go back and, and fix it. Uh, and clients I've worked for um, would, would just reject it and say, no, we're not paying you for that. Go back and fix it. You know, this is just, uh, this is not up to scratch. This is, this is not what we expect. So, um, you know, hopefully the whole, this West Connects, $3.9 billion uh, piece of work is not going to go the way of the light rail because, you know, really good quality work is not being done. Something to think about.